it's a, a real privilege and a great honor for Hilda and me to be here and because uh, Jackson was one of my great heroes and uh, indeed he was the hero of every one of the 100 American lawyers in Nuremberg who participated in the 12 subsequent trials following the big trial that Jackson was prosecutor in. The great effectiveness that uh, Robert H. Jackson had in, those, in that case, he was uh, just superb. And uh, I think he's, his uh, contribution uh, to the development of the Nuremberg trials was just incalculable. He, he was magnificent. Uh, I went over as uh, General Taylor's uh, legal assistant, and of course, as soon as I got there, I received assignments from Telford Taylor and uh, involving uh, drafting of the indictments and collecting evidence, and uh, I traveled with uh, General Taylor, uh, Hilda and I did, all over Europe uh, collecting evidence and talking to prospective witnesses in a good many of the capitals of Europe. As you were preparing for the trials, did you know you were going to have the, the two trials that you were participating in, the doctor's trial and the Oswald Pohl trial? No, that developed uh, as time went on. Mm -hmm. I was involved early on in the uh, as I said, the preparation of a good many of the trials. In fact, I worked on almost all of the 12 cases at one time or another as, a tel as a General Taylor's assistant. Here we're, how's we're going to divide, uh, have a division of labor, or did he kind of take you under the wing and say, Jack, I want you to do X, Y, and Z? <laughs> it was more the latter. Yeah. I, my office was in his outer office, and uh, so I worked with him uh, very closely, day by day. Okay. Ask permission from the, uh, I guess, the military government at the time uh, to uh, take the pretrial deposition of Herman Goering, and that was granted. And uh, so I spent about an hour taking uh, his deposition, and this was a few days before the sentencing uh, by the military tribunal. He was a cooperative witness, I might say, but he was also a very arrogant person. He, uh, Describe him. What, what did he look like? Well, he uh, had uh, lost a lot of weight. I think he, when he was captured, it was around, he weighed around 300 pounds, mm -hmm. and he was down to 162 pounds in his, his military uniform without insignia, uh, hung on him like a gunny sack. When he entered the chamber, he clicked his heels and <laughs> saluted, and uh, he assumed that he was in complete charge of the interrogation. <laughs> Did you tell him in advance the areas you wanted to talk about? Yes, and uh, he freely admitted his complicity in the uh, use of uh, slave labor in the concentration camps, but he denied uh, any knowledge of the atrocious conditions in the concentration camp. His testimony, I don't think, was of any particular value to us in the Pole case. The fourth case was the Pole case, and uh, General Taylor asked me to be the chief prosecutor in that case. Did you also get a chance to interview Oswald Pole? Yes, uh, and uh, of course I cross-examined him uh, at the trial, and, uh, and a good many of the other 18 defendants. Military Tribunal 1. Uh, worked on the uh, indictment. I helped collect the evidence. I interviewed a good many of the witnesses who had been concentration camp inmates. 
I uh, presented evidence at the, uh, at the trial, I think both in direct evidence and cross-examination of, of defendants. Hitler's immediate subordinate and in charge of uh, medical services throughout, uh, throughout Germany. What was your impression of him? He was a very competent doctor, a very arrogant uh, man. Uh, he was uh, completely dedicated to Hitler and to the Nazi philosophy. And he was, uh, what was his relationship to Mengele? Uh, I have to tell you, I can't remember. I, Mengele, of course, was not brought to trial in uh, Nuremberg because he hadn't been apprehended at the time. And uh, I don't recall the relationship. Mengele was in one of the concentration camps and would have been under uh, <coughs> under uh, Brandt's supervision and would have been under the auspices of uh, the officers in the Pole case also. Well, I think that, uh, for example, and there were many such examples, uh, the poison bullets uh, that were used to shoot inmates to see how Quick, how quickly the uh, inmate would die, and uh, then the medic, then the uh, the freezing experiments were horrendous. Also, um, uh, concentration camp inmates were uh, dunked in freezing water and uh, left outside in uh, sub-zero temperatures for hours and many died from uh, the, that kind of an experimentation. But all of the experiments that were conducted in the concentration camps were really horrendous. The philosophy behind the experimentation was not, uh, in general, to uh, develop uh, medical advances. It was to uh, see how effectively methods could be devised to kill and not to cure. The prosecution cannot take credit for having introduced uh, as the, the uh, Nuremberg Code as a proposed findings. Uh, there were uh, ten fundamental principles of, uh, of uh, medical experimentation that were developed and enunciated in the court's opinion in the doctor's uh, the medical experimentation case. Severity of the sentences declined. Uh, the, all of the death uh, sentences occurred in three cases that were tried early on, namely the medical case, the poll case, and the Einsatzgruppen case. Uh, but as time went on, the sentences became less and less severe so that toward the end of the uh, 12 cases, the, uh, the sentences were greatly mitigated. And I think that was largely because of the Cold War and the perceived need to uh, to obtain some of the expertise that the German uh, people had uh, to, uh, to be utilized against the, uh, the Russians. What is the legacy of the Nuremberg trials? I think the primary legacy is the establishment of the principle that of criminal responsibility uh, for even the heads of state. And this, uh, the trials themselves are international trials. They were international criminal trials. And I think that is the legacy of Nuremberg.